Good afternoon. It's very early morning here in Chicago. I'm very happy to be with you. Sorry I could not be with you in person next time. Next time. Um, I wanted to thank the Haruv Institute and especially Dr. Paula David and Professor Arie for inviting me. I'm honored um, to speak in memory of my dear friend and teacher, Patricia, who's gone too soon from us. May her memory be a blessing. I also want to acknowledge with gratitude in my talk for the learning I have from so many people, but especially from Rebecca Shimun Chanuk, Jerry Paul, Erna Furman, Betty Fleming, uh, all the other teachers who've gone before us and uh, from all my supervisees um, from whom I've learned so much. Um, just a little overview of what we're going to talk about today. I will start with a mindfulness moment. Um, and then we're going, feel free to use the chat. And I don't speak Hebrew, but Paula does. And she will interrupt and translate as chats come up. If you have questions, it's completely fine to um, interject your questions as we go. We're going to think together about reflective practice and reflective supervision and what that means. Um, less specific to CPP and really focused um, overarchingly on all early childhood work and workers. Um, going over the basics and thinking about relationships and how to build relationship muscles and then thinking into next steps together. I want to acknowledge that we don't know each other. We don't have a relationship, you and I, and that we're going to think about some important ideas together. Please let's assume benevolence for each other and hold a stance of compassion for self and for each other. Being okay with beginner mind and not knowing if some of this feels new. Uh, being okay with vulnerability in your training and learning on the road to growth. And let's celebrate and not be ashamed of our humanity and in sharing what feels hard in our struggles with each other. Just a moment for mindful self-regulation. Let's think together about what do, what do you do to help yourself when you're feeling discombobulated in your work, in the moment? What do you do later if you're still feeling that? What if you feel activated during this talk? Can you use some mindful self-regulation tools to help yourself? be calm and be curious about your reaction. And let's take a moment together to just breathe and get centered and be fully present. I know you've all been working today. Let's set aside what's been in your day and set aside what's coming up next. Let's be open to whatever ideas come up for you today, what resonates for you. As you turn your attention inward and just start noticing your breath, and the bodily container of your breath and where your breath moves. And if you're comfortable doing so, go ahead and close your eyes as you settle into your breath for a moment. And put your mind in your lungs. Your lungs live on the back of your body. Put your mind in your lungs. Noticing the 360 degrees of the container that it moves in every direction with ease and with softness. As we settle into our time together. Two more breaths like this. Always breathing in and out through the nose. And last breath. And on your next inhale, go ahead and open your eyes. So why do we reflect? And what's that all about? And you may have thought a lot about this already, that early childhood is a time of the greatest growth and development. And it's also a time when grownups have the greatest opportunity to shape the child's future. How can we make sure we're making the most of this opportunity? We are responsible for helping others in our roles. And we try to do our best to make positive difference for each child and each family with whom we work. 
And you already know and accept that relationships are the foundations of development. All the relationships that touch young children are so important. And for the adults involved with them, respectful, reliable, and comfortable working relationships help us achieve the shared goals of helping young children grow. And what does this have to do with reflecting? You know, Bert Powell, he's one of the originators of the circle security model. He's truly lovely. He asked this question, what is it like to experience you? Can you jot down, just wherever you are, I'm not collecting these, a few words, paying attention to what are your aspirational notions about what it's like to experience you as a professional? Right, that's the how do I want, hope I am experienced? How do I hope others experience me? And also the shadow, the things you worry about, maybe not so good or not so nice qualities. The things we all worry about that people can see and that we wish they didn't see. Or maybe these are things you wanna change or things that you're working on. Shut down both of those. When I've done this activity in a workshop experiential way, what I notice in the breakout rooms is um, overwhelmingly people load for the negative, providers load for the negative. Here's the things I worry about. And it's hard for them to reach for the, what are the aspirational, what are the yummy good things about you and about your experience as a helper? And the real question here is how do others experience you? Reflecting. And true connection is being vulnerable. And relationships embody this. Someone trying to jump in? Okay. Very young children stir powerful feelings in adults. And moreover, parents and dyadic interactions evoke complex responses in professionals that are often difficult to sort out and respond to in ways that support the parent and the child and the relationship between them. And this is Fenichel quote, and you've probably heard this before. Have you been in this experience, having powerful feelings evoked in you by some aspect of the work you're doing? It's normal. It would be peculiar if someone answered no, <laughs> I've never had that experience and I would worry about that, right? So it's a normal part of our work with young children and families. So to whom do you go to think and feel about your own experiences in the work, your reactions, your feelings, and your impressions? I'm gonna give my little definition of reflective supervision. And this is from my friend Rebecca's work, who we also lost in 2020. That reflective supervision is a collaborative relationship between supervisor and supervisee for professional growth that improves program quality and practice by cherishing strengths and partnering around vulnerabilities to generate growth. A reflective supervisor tailors the learning opportunities to each supervisee by providing a reliable, respectful relationship over time, one where the reflective supervisor listens deeply, a capacity that sets the tone between them and allows the supervisor to really come to know the unique qualities of the provider before her. And together, this unique dyad pay attention, developing and deepening shared attention to the work and the feelings that are aroused by it. And these reflective partners then discuss together what they notice, they exchange and share perspectives, they widen each other's horizons and often plan next steps in the work for the provider. So there's shared thought shared care and awareness and planning between them that continues to grow over time and becomes the cornerstone 
in the supervisee's practice. I um, collected some things that I think are really tenets of reflective supervision. These, a commitment to evolving growth and change, a mutuality of shared goals, a commitment to reflecting on one's work, respect for individuals, sensitivity to context, open communication, commitment to staff standards of excellence, where staff are encouraged to learn and grow. And uh, many of these come from um, Judy Bertaki's work here in Chicago. And I'm, I'm really calling these our relationship-based tenants for relationship-based work, right? It's a relationship where we learn to look, listen, and learn, and that it's really a journey. We're never there. It's always a process. So why do we reflect? <clears throat> this is my colleague, Tina Doro. She's also a CPP trainer. The practitioner's experiences, thoughts, and feelings can create blind spots that block perceptions of important family interactions and lead to missed opportunities for meaningful and effective interventions. The practitioner may fail to notice and explore salient family interactions and or misunderstand the underlying meaning of those interactions. Reflection is a tool that enhances the practitioner's awareness of multiple influences and is viewed through their own experience. I sometimes meet clinicians and I train a lot of um, new to the field clinicians. Um, that's been an evolution in CPP, which is a different talk that we can have another time. But I sometimes meet clinicians um, or teachers or other early childhood providers who've never received reflective supervision and they're really not excited about the prospect of it. Why do you imagine that may be? You can put that in the chat if you have a reflection about that. Oopsie, sorry about that. I think we all have reactions and feelings about you know, showing our work to each other. And those of us who are clinicians or psychotherapists, we have a weird job. We have one of the few jobs where we basically do it in secret, right? If you become a physician or a surgeon, you watch other people do surgery, you practice in front of other people, your work is very out there and transparent, at least to your colleagues. Um, in psychotherapy, that's not the case unless you were trained where, you know, you'd use a two-way, uh, one-way mirror or your, your, your um, supervisor and some you know, schools do this, right? Where your supervisor's in the room. But for the most part, we're relying on you as your supervisors to tell us what happened. And the nature of being human is that you're not gonna do that. You're going to edit either consciously or unconsciously. And the invitation in reflective supervision is to set aside your internal um, editor, right? Um, and the worries that come up around that <clears throat> for providers, you know, um, some of what, whom have are, are articulated this for me is like, well, what if I'm doing it wrong? What if I'm doing it wrong and Paula sees me and I'm a terrible provider and then she'll judge how poorly skilled I am or my lower capacity. What if she thinks I'm bad at this job? What if I totally disagree with what she says or what, you know, that she thinks I should do and I'm unable to voice that? I've actually even heard people say, um, providers say I'm private and I don't, um, none of myself spills into my professional self. That is simply not possible. But I've, you know, I've had more than one provider say this to me. So interesting, right? So what are some of the essential features of reflective supervision? And, and all of the important authors on this subject really um, have condensed it down to three aspects, reflection. Lily, I just wanna say somebody wrote in the chat here, Seagal wrote to us that she assumes that the clinicians are not always comfortable sharing their feelings, especially the judgment and supervision. Thank you, thank you, Seagal. 
I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate your, your sharing that. And I think that's true. And I think that there's been a, um, a misunderstanding somewhere along in our field that our feelings um, reveal a lack of professionalism. And Patricia um, often said that those of you and those of us who share our feelings and reflect deeply about what is evoked in us by the work and the families with whom we work, um, we evaluate you as being more highly skilled when you are able to share um, the rich, um, evocative feeling states that come up for you. Yeah, and I think as, as teachers, as educators, and as um, reflective supervisors, that's part of our responsibility to help um, bridge that to our new to the field professionals, right? To say, here's how, here's how we do it. It will feel uncomfortable. Here's how we might do that and think about that together. What's it like for you to think about sharing with me feelings that come up, judgment, biases, and knowing that I'm not gonna judge you um, or evaluate you about that, that we're gonna take a stance of curiosity, pour some love on these ideas and see what we learn from it. Thank you. So back to our essential features of reflective supervision, reflection, collaboration, regularity. And I really highlighted here in the circle, I think some of the core notions, not all of them, but really we, we focus intensely and, and I think it's important to highlight really doing reflective supervision is spending your hour or hour and fifth, or an hour and a half, whatever your time is on one family, right? It's not an overview of all your cases, right? It's thinking deeply together about maybe even one interaction, one or a couple of interactions from one session or classroom interaction that was stirring and that we can explore that. And that it's, it's in a culture of emotional safety that there's full participation of both parties where vulnerabilities are embraced. There's listening and more listening. There's no judgment. Of course, there's confidentiality and attunement, regulation, authenticity. And we think of it as a place to pause. Paula, did you want to jump in? Yeah, there's um, uh, um, uh, Marie Karen also added in the chat yeah. that in her eyes, it's not very different from talking about countertransference, which is the main focus of the traditional supervision in psychodynamic psychotherapy. Which I'm, is so maybe I'm, that missing raised, something. I'm so glad that you raised that because I'm also trained uh, psychoanalytically. And um, I learned early on in my, um, at least in the US, in my training career and training other people is that not everyone has been exposed to that concept. Um, or is comfortable with it. Like in some communities, it's seen as a bad thing. Like you're a inadequate worker if you have countertransference. And I would argue that you're just a human worker when you have countertransference, right? And I agree with you completely that it is a, a thorough exploration um, and a place to learn about the meaning of your countertransference, um, both about yourself and about the work, because sometimes it's evoked from external, which we'll talk about, and sometimes it's an internal um, evocation, right? Thank you. So reflection, the first of the three essential features, is really a wondering together about the history, the feelings that come up in everyone, in the caregiver, in the child, in the teachers, and you, and other providers, and the expectations that the provider has related to all these events. And we think about everybody involved. We even think about the, the grownups who are not in the room. Right, who are the other important people who have big feelings. Um, it's a trusted relationship that can foster reflection and cultivates thinking out loud. So in this way, I think of it as like brainstorming where everything's allowed and everything's invited. And it's deep listening to one's feelings and thoughts and another's feelings and thoughts. And this is really Rebecca's distilled notions about this. So reflection about the client, the child, the relationship, behaviors, feelings, and concerns of the family. And it's also so important to remember it's about the worker's feelings, thoughts, responses, reactions to the family. And it's not rushing to advise or to teach 
or to direct or to correct. Reflection is really a stepping back to consider the work from multiple perspectives. And I think of it as taking a wider lens, a more macro lens or seeing the forest. There's an expression in English, right? Do you see the forest for the trees? And you wanna see the forest as a reflective supervisor because when we're the provider, we see the bark of the tree because our nose is pressed right up against the system, right? And the reflective supervisor is there to hold that broader perspective. Collaboration, we recognize that each of us have expertise and we bring something important. Judgment is suspended and collaboration does require participation of all participants. Um, and that power differences are set aside during reflective supervision. And it's a mutual exchange of ideas. This is, this is a, a, a jump for many of our new to the field providers, right? Because they're used to being in a student teacher relationship. And maybe you as a reflective supervisor, are also a teacher or a professor, and you're used to being in a teacher, you know, relationship. And I, I certainly fall into that, at, you know, going into my role as professor versus my role as reflective supervisor, I have to be cautious about that. But how do we invite our supervisees to think of themselves as mutually collaborative in this process? that they don't have to defer to me as some kind of expert in anything, that we're there in relationship to explore and wonder together. And I, my, my thought is you have to make that really explicit for providers to get what they need out of it. And of course, regularity. Regularity, of course, is a regularly occurring meeting, ideally a standing time. Um, so the scheduling has to be there and the space must be protected without interruptions, I would add without cell phones, without cell phone alarms, you know, um, and that all members of reflective supervision are showing up with their full attention. So that we set aside everything. When I first um, took over as the director of counseling at, uh, I Paula knows this, I was at uh, Jewish Child and Family Services here in Chicago for many, many years. And when I moved here, from another city, um, this was not a protected space. That was not the culture in the department that I inherited. And it was very common for people to knock on the door or just open my door during someone else's reflective supervision. So there was really a learning time for the whole team, for administrative support team to understand that when the doors close and when Paul and I are together, right, that that is, that is sanctuary time, right? That nobody comes in, nobody interrupts. And that I'm not gonna schedule my dental appointment for that hour, right? Nor will, nor will Paula. That that is um, our time every Thursday at four o'clock, we're meeting, right? That's our reflective supervision time. Um, and, and thinking about that is so important. I think that the predictable routines and that frequency really work to create interpersonal safety. That's what's necessary for authentic interaction. And so that we can really start to think and feel about strengths and vulnerabilities and all the issues that arise in practice. I wonder um, what comes up for folks when thinking about protecting that time. Um, often people, this is the slide where people have strong reactions. We can't do that. <laughs> the culture in my agency doesn't support that. <laughs> How can we possibly meet every week? Um, we have to be seeing clients at that time. And with apologies, I have my dachshunds here and they're having some reactions and I will, uh, they are usually very quiet, but that could change. For supervisees to be regularity is, um, I, I like to be clear with, in our new relationship with my supervisees that it means coming on time, coming prepared, having, having sent me reflective content, either video, or process recordings or whatever notes that they want to share with me ahead of time. So that we're when we're actually face to face or zoom to zoom, we're we're in it together. And I'm not reading prep material, right? So that we've we've both prepared, that we're thinking together deeply in the time. It's then that it's not a check-in for like all your 15 cases. Like, I just wanna give you an update, Dr. David, about my 15 cases or these five cases because I'm feeling anxious and need to unload that. Um, historically, what I did in, in, my, in my, it's not the only way, I'm just sharing my way. 
I did schedule um, an hour and a half for new to the field professionals because there was that sense of urgency that they often came with of needing to say, here's my anxiety that I need to offload to you around four things and maybe some administrative concerns. So then we still had the 60 minutes uh, for pure reflection and they kind of needed that, the warm up 30 minutes to settle down and be able to um, sit in the space of reflection in a different way. Just one idea. Wonder what you all have done. Some examples, people always ask me, well, what does reflection sound like? These are just some examples. This might be a way to explore multiple perspectives or personal or cultural biases. So who's the child in this family? Who is the child to this family? So what did he embody? Are y'all familiar with um, um, Charlie Zena's working model of the child interview? This to me gets to some of those questions. These are some questions. of us are. Yeah, it's a yeah. wonderful tool. Um, and if you can get Julie LaRue or Charlie to train y'all, that's a wonderful bonus. Um, as a reflective supervisor, I might ask, I keep wondering about dad. We're never talking about dad. Where's he in this story? Or I keep wondering about the miscarriage that nobody talks about, right? The lost one. Or I might be curious about grandma's role since they live in grandma's house. I might think with a worker, what's your hunch about this dynamic between mom and grandma or mom and dad or mom and baby? Thinking together about how do the different members respond and explore each little cog. How do you, provider, understand that behavior? And I'm going to give you a clinical example here. And if you were mom or dad or grandma or baby, what do you think you would do in that moment? Really asking the provider to put themselves in another shoes. And what do you think baby would like to say to you? And I have the resources here if you're interested. So I have permission um, to share this clinical example with you from a um, former supervisee who is still a consultee. So I no longer work for that agency, but many of the people who um, worked for me and were my supervisees in the past, um, six years later are still working with me in consultation, which is I think a, another lovely example of that. It's a real relationship. And it's a, a lifelong professional or a, or a season long professional relationship right, to support growth and learning. Um, and I had a, a, a CPP provider who, who was trained by me, um, who was not new to the field, but new to um, counseling. She had done residential work here in Chicago, which is just a different flavor of work, much more crisis driven work. And so trained in CPP, was doing CPP um, in home, which is how we often do it in child welfare here, and was working with a foster mom and three little foster children who were, those children were siblings, the three were siblings, and they were all under six. And her process recording, and she and I actually just touched base about this this weekend, because I told her I was gonna use her example again. Um, and her process recording said, so there was a, an issue between two of the kids and um, with a toy and some hitting, and what the clinician wrote was, and foster mom handled it nicely. And then she went on to something else. So that was part, that was something I highlighted in the process recording, which she gave to me ahead of time. And then when we met, I asked her about it. And she said, oh, I just thought she did such a nice job. I said, well, can you tell me what happened? Because what I hear there is editorial, right? There's some, where's the data? Where's all the details? The devil's in the details, as you all know. Where's the details of that interaction? Um, and there was a red flag for me, just you know, in my intuitive experience of supervising, like there's more to that story. So when we um, got into the details, it turns out that child, so the child, uh, I'll say child A, B, and C from oldest to youngest. So that child B had been reprimanded by mom for hitting child C, the baby, the littlest. And, but what had really happened prior to that was the baby bit the middle child. <laughs> and it was a retaliation. And this clinician was there for the whole thing and felt that mom handled it well, that uh, foster mom that, you know, the, scolded the middle child for yeah, defending uh, himself, uh, right? And that felt so mixed up. Yeah. I think somebody's trying to jump in, Paula. 
Um, and then we could slow that down and think about that's so interesting that you didn't notice that in the moment. And where, what you shared with me is it went really well. And it sounds like it was kind of an unsatisfying situation for the littles and maybe for mom, because she didn't, you know, maybe know what to do or how to handle all of that. Maybe mom felt fine about it. So thinking about multiple perspectives. And I wondered with this clinician, if they were, if they thought they were doing CPP in that moment and her, the, the clinician's initials are AMR. And she said, no, I think I'm doing AMR. <laughs> therapy, <laughs> right? In other words, something was evoked in her, which she then shared with me, which I had not known, that she is one of three and she was the middle. And she was the middle. So there was a ghost in her nursery, right? That was coming up. And I won't share the rest of her personal story, but she shared a little bit of it. It wasn't, you know, it's not like a big T trauma, but it was this blind spot for her that she couldn't see that you, you know, it, the parental capacity building area here might be, gosh, wouldn't it be interesting if we could hold all three children in mind and all of their experiences and mom's experience in mind, right? To expand our vision of what happened. So thinking about perspective taking and what are our personal, what are our personal and potential blind spots? Some other, questions for reflection might be noticing emotion. So in that clinical case, what do you think mom was feeling in the moment? What do you think mom feels about it now? What do you think middle child felt in the moment? What do you think she's feeling now? What was it like for you, provider, to experience that? And then in what ways are you experiencing pressure to do something in the moment, in your sessions, in your classroom? Do you ever feel that like, is sitting there and listening enough? You know, Patricia, I think Paula, you mentioned it in your introduction, Patricia used to say, don't just do something, sit there, zip it. She literally would say, zip it. When you don't know what to do, zip it and sit on your hands. You'll look smart and you won't do any harm, right? Wait, watch and wonder. What does that feel like to sit there? with this family? Is there something that, um, that activates a pressure in you, right, to want to do? And so what comes up for you in that moment and then what comes up for you later on reflection? Some more questions for reflection. Whose perspective is it easiest for me to take? I uh, was trained in a child analytic setting. Uh, my bias, it's very easy for me to take preschoolers perspective and toddlers perspective. And I have to watch that because I can lose a caregiver's perspective, right? So I personally, that's, that's something I know about myself. If I'm working with Dr. David and she's my reflective supervisor, I want her to know that, hey, this has been a, sometimes been a blind spot for me. You're like, just, I want you to know because you don't know me yet as we get to know each other, it would be important for you to know. I also get really triggered by justice issues. You should know that about me, right? Because it'll come up in my work. And I'll, want, I'll need extra help in thinking and holding that with you. Now, our new to the field providers don't necessarily know what gets them, right? And they don't know it's okay to say all that. I have, the nice thing about getting older is um, I'm super okay with what I don't know, right? And I'm really excited about learning from other people, which feels very different than my early professional self and how I started. So I am interested and curious about what is stirred up inside me. I don't, I don't any longer have shame and judgment about it, but I did in my early career and just my early humanity, right? That that's where we all start. And then pay attention, help them learn to pay attention to what physical or somatic experiences you're having. Do you always get a stomach ache? Do you start to sweat with this family? You don't sweat with all your families? That's important information. That's important information. Be open to blind spots and misses in your work. And be open to noticing what parts of the work are really energizing for you and what parts take away your energy. Sorry about that. The dog barking discombobulated me, full disclosure. That's the dog who's downstairs, she's barking. Paula, was there um, a comment? No, I was just gonna ask if it's your dog because um, otherwise I would search to mute somebody. No, but, uh... it's my dog. I have, a, I have a 14 and a half year old dog downstairs who didn't wanna come up the stairs today and she's, she gets, imaginary things that she barks at right now. <laughs> We're in that phase of her development. 
So we think in reflective supervision and reflective practice that the relationship is the basis for learning and growing. And that these key relationship-based concepts that you accept as providers in early childhood work, whether you're a psychologist, a social worker, a therapist, a teacher, some early, other early childhood provider, these are all key relationship-based concepts that we all accept are important. And I, I took this list from um, Patricia and Alicia and Chandra Goshippen's um, work in Don't Hit My Mommy. Safety, physiological regulation, so dyadic affect regulation, identifying and managing difficult feelings, offering opportunities for new learning while attending to the needs and the experience, making meaning of difficult events and feelings and co-creating a narrative. And reflective supervision provides safety for exploring and learning and affect regulation as needed. People sometimes cry in, super, in reflective supervision. We learn what it's about and we learn to make meaning from that. I like this quote from Brene Brown. I hope you guys are familiar with her. She's a, she has a big TED talk presence in the US. And this is a quote, in our culture, we associate vulnerability with emotions we want to avoid, such as fear, shame, and uncertainty. Yet we too often lose sight of the fact that vulnerability is also the birthplace of joy, of belonging, creativity, authenticity, and love. And I sometimes uh, think about this and even offer this notion to new providers, new to the field or new to reflective supervision. To me, it gets back to the worry, um, and I think it was Seagal who brought it up, the worry about showing our work and the worry about showing our emotions to somebody and um, wondering about the belief that people bring to RS around, um, if I'm professional, I don't show feelings. And I don't know how that is because I think we accept as therapists that um, there's nothing bad, inherently bad about affect or feelings, right? That that's, that's literally the, the job description as a therapist um, is to be okay with different affective states, including your own. So it's an opportunity, I think, for healing in ourselves. I think these assumptions apply to everyone in relationship-based work that, because we are part of the equation. Adults were once children. Adults understand the world and engage in behavior based on their past and current experiences. In other words, behavior has meaning. That this work is hard and can evoke powerful emotions that it's important to be aware of the thoughts and feelings that are evoked in us. And an important part of our jobs is to be in relationship with others and how others are impacts us and how we are impacts others. And that positive relational experiences are healing for all of us and that we're all just doing the best we can. That we're here to help each other. Some key principles of reflection is that it's a lifelong developmental process and it's influenced by the past, the present, and how we process information. So uh, context, right? Reflection occurs in relationship that's co-created over time. If you don't know me, you're probably not gonna be super excited to come sit with me and reflect about things, particularly if you're new to the, the concept of reflection. That safety and exploration of dynamics, holding space to co-carry is inherent in reflection. And it requires slowing down and intentionally stepping back. The devil is in the details. That was a Patricia quote, that we hold multiple perspectives and we think together when we are re-experiencing reactions. Feelings do matter and relationships bring them up. And that the parallel process is very intentionally 
explored. And we're going to talk a little bit about, more about parallel process before we finish today. So reflective supervision is a relationship for learning. Here's Rebecca again. The partnership nurtures a process of remembering, reviewing, thinking out loud about a specific child, the people who surround that child and what happens or doesn't between them. It could be said that reflective supervision enhances vision, clarifying what is seen and what is seeable. In a real sense, the effect of reflective supervision is that it nourishes what she called supervision, the ability to see further and deeper and more. And I just invite you to think for a minute what comes up for you when you read this. Do you think the culture of urgency in our field? Um, is really an obstacle with achieving this, right? Something we always have to have an eye on. Here's uh, Tramel. Reflective supervision is how you learn that it's a process of feeling and seeing and noticing what it is you're doing and then learning from what you feel and see or notice. And finally, then intelligently adjusting your practice. So not reactively adjusting your practice, right? To me, reflection is the opposite of reaction. We can start in reaction without judgment, like I'm in reaction. That's when you zip it and put your hands under your, under your legs, right? Don't do anything, just watch. And then I'll go to supervision with Paula and say, oh, I was so activated. I really want, I didn't do anything, but I was flipping out in that moment. But can we think about this and unpack it together and try to understand? And there may then be an adjustment in my practice subsequent to that collaboration, co-regulation, and thoughtful reflection. I do um, believe that reflective practice does promote regulation in providers because it develops a capacity for being aware of your own emotional responses, um, awareness of your own cultural biases, your own personal biases, an ability to consider multiple perspectives, ability to recognize and regulate strong emotions prior to intervening. Please don't intervene when you're activated. Any of us, so hard to do, so hard to do. Try it in your family. You'll see how hard it is to do, <laughs> right? And the ability to use supervision and consultation to process strong emotions, to consider alternative perspectives and seek new knowledge and skills is inherently regulated. Right, you're engaging your prefrontal cortex. I love this metaphor. It's something I use all the time in my training. I have my own dolls here on my desk that stay with me. This metaphor of the nested dolls of holding and being held and feeling and being felt with. What's so hard about working with small children and their caregivers and with each other? I love this metaphor because it, to me, it speaks to the parallel process. To the degree it's hard for me to go to Dr. David and, and share all my isness and my humanity and my vulnerability, really there's a parallel here to what it must feel like for caregivers to come to me as a provider and do the same thing, which we ask them to do. And then we label them as non-compliant when they fail to do it in what we deem a timely manner. How mixed up. Right, that is not coming from a place of understanding and compassion. That we can only hold what we are helped to hold. We can only hold what we are helped to hold. So how can I possibly hold strong feelings in my clients and the family members if I cannot hold my own strong feelings and haven't been helped by my benevolent reflective supervisor to hold that? Right, that's this idea. And I, I always say that the, the big doll is the consultant, then maybe the agency, then the supervisor, then the therapist, then the mom or dad, and then the baby. You see how far away I am from the baby, right? The parents get to hold the baby. If I'm the provider, I hold the parents. My supervisor holds me. Hopefully my agency holds the supervisor. <laughs> <Paula's> like, eh. <laughs> but your consultants will hold all of you, 
right? And that, that the tone, the emotional tone of that will get transmitted. Remember that while we may really want to hold that baby, our job is to hold the caregiver when it's with a provider and then to hold each other. So reflective supervision and consultation, there is a difference between reflective supervision and reflective consultation. Um, I am mostly a reflective consultant, um, which is to say I don't meet weekly. Reflective supervision in an ideal aspirational setting would be weekly. Um, consultation, most people come once or twice a month. So there's less frequency. Um, do you come prepared to both, to either? Do you ask, how do you experience me? I'm a provider. How do you, supervisor, consultant, experience me? Do you ask that question? I think a lot of providers don't ask that question. How do my clients experience me? It's painful to think about those kinds of questions. Do you ask your supervisor, your reflective supervisor, what am I missing? What blind spots do you see that I can't see yet? There's a process in reflective supervision. It's always gonna be different because it's shaped by the individuals who are involved. Uh, but there are some really core processes that have been defined. Um, it's really a relationship to improve professional practice, but there is a parallel process that's alive in reflective supervision. And one may describe that as um, passing on of emotional tone passing on of emotional tone. We're all formed, as you all agree, by early attachment relationships um, and the very deep learning that comes from those early relationships for good and for bad. Um, and that we can continue to have deep learning experiences in the context of relationship. I think there's some belief in some cultures, at least in the US, that um, as you grow up, you should need people less you should be, there's a really a culture here of right, full of determinism and individuality and, and not being in community, which of course is the opposite of what we're talking about, that we very much in this field need and, and honor and um, celebrate community and vulnerability and leaning on each other and learning from each other. Um, that the, the emotional tone of the reflective supervisory relationship will impact what happens with the littlest doll right, in the parent-child relationship. That's the parallel process that we're really paying attention to. Treat people the way you want other people to treat other people, right? That's Jerry, an adaptation of what Jerry Paul said. Um, do unto others as you would have others do unto others. Uh, Jerry Paul also, this is a wonderful quote. I'm sure you're all familiar with this one. It's not possible to work on behalf of human beings to try to help them without having powerful feelings aroused in yourself. And in working with families who are in great difficulty, rage can become the most familiar affect of the provider. Rage at the system, rage at a world with too much violence that creates too much helplessness, and also at a family who will not be better or even seem to try. I always share this with um, newer providers and hope that it is freeing <laughs> to, for them. So I wanna share some slides. These are actually CPP slides, but they think together about emotions and intervention. And our, emotional, um, our emotions, of course, influence our capacity for thoughtful intervention. When your emotions are charged, in other words, when your amygdala is activated, your executive function, your prefrontal cortex is disengaged. And I, I use, have you seen Dan Siegel's um, model of the mind? You can YouTube it, and he has this lovely model of the mind. This is a regulate, right? <laughs> this is a regulated brain. This is a flipped lid, right? So when you're activated, your prefrontal cortex is offline. It's difficult to think clearly, to be flexible. It's very difficult to hold another's perspective. And traumatic content that we hear, that we witness, has a higher potential to dysregulate the provider. Right? A quote from Chandra Ghosh Ippen is: "It is best not to intervene without your frontal lobes." That was a nicer way of what Patricia used to say, which is zip it <laughs> if you're activated, <laughs> right? Don't say or do anything. It's not, um, oops, where's my other slide? 
Okay, I'm missing the slide, that's okay. What, with reflective practice, the overview here is to think about there's two aspects of it, to go inwards around self-regulation and self-reflection in, in any case or classroom or family session, we want to cultivate an awareness of your own emotional reactions, an awareness of your cultural or personal biases, and the capacity to recognize and regulate your strong emotions prior to intervening. That's an extra capacity skill, right? There's a lot of things that come up for us um, in the work, not just rage. It might be um, fatigue, depression. I, I see it a lot in losing boundaries, right? Crossing boundary, boundary transgressions in somebody who maybe you wouldn't have thought would do that, either in your personal life, you know, where you're working too many hours and you're not keeping that, that work-life balance um, or in your professional life. Um, I often ask in consultation, how did you feel during that session and sitting with that mom or that child? And I very often am responded to with a content answer, not a feeling answer, which in reflective supervision, I notice in a nice way, in a gentle way. Oh, that was a lot of important content, but I didn't hear any feelings, right? Because we all just kind of go to content to stay away from affect. So it's practice practice of getting back to the feelings, right? So we also want to think about going outwards, reflection on the other, what Fonagy calls theory of mind. I think we're all very comfortable with this. We love to theorize about what they're up to. <laughs> it's easier than thinking about what's going on inside of us. So we want to cultivate the ability to consider all perspectives, to understand beliefs, values, and behavior in the context of development, needs, motivation, current ecological and cultural contexts and historical contexts like trauma history, prior relationships, prior interactions with service providers, historical trauma. Get team support. Go for regulation and reflection. Think about your interventions. Develop core competencies and skills. Think about what you might say or do. And reflective supervision will also improve our capacity to respond and help us to feel more regulated and more integrated. There are some barriers which we touched on a little bit to reflective supervision and you can certainly add your ideas about this in the chat. A culture in your agency or your setting of urgency, like that reactivity. Um, I just learned this term. Some of my providers have been using this cow um, in English, the crisis of the week. Right, culture, whatever the client brings in as the crisis, and then we have to deal with the crisis so we don't think about reflecting. Um, maybe a culture of concrete solutions. Give me skills. An inability to tolerate painful feelings in ourselves and others. I see this a lot. I'm so puzzled by it. Again, it's another talk. We're the, Those of us who are therapists, what did y'all think we would be talking about in therapy? Happy thoughts? <laughs> I could be part of therapy, but we the definition of the job is tolerating painful affect in others. So what are some other obstacles to effectiveness here? Might be, you might not know what you're doing. Insufficient knowledge or skill. They could be emotionally over involved in the case. Too many service providers leads to fragmentation of relationships, <clears throat> role conflict or role confusion, lack of safe clinical supervision, lack of agency support, conflicting inter-system priorities, or overriding financial considerations. So these are, these are reality that we all deal with working in organizations. These can be obstacles that we need to think deeply about. Uh, <clears throat> I'm aware of time, Paula, just so you know. Learning to self-regulate as a professional is so important. Before, during and after the session, the class or family interaction. We all learned or didn't learn our regulation strategies via co-regulation in our families of origin. And this can be a good go-to around co-regulation or, or maybe it's so, an area for growth because it wasn't something your family did well. I would also offer that this is really different than venting because sometimes people say, well, I don't need reflective supervision because I have my colleagues and we vent 
about things. Teachers often say this to me. Um, emotion is contagious, pandemic, case in point. That's part of what we notice in our work with young children and their caregivers. We sit with people, we feel their feelings, right? You all have been in the situation with toddlers, maybe you have toddlers where the contagion effect, one toddler starts crying and give it a minute, they're all gonna start you know, puffing and, and weeping shortly. It's, we're designed as humans to have contagion of affect. How do we learn as professionals to differentiate this from others? So the first question to me, and this is from um, Chandra's book, Golden Pot, if you haven't seen that lovely book, what is it like for you when you flip your lid? You could take note for yourself and I invite you to take this to reflect your supervision. What happens when you get dysregulated in a session? What does it feel like? Where do you physically feel it in your body? There's so many reasons this could happen. We won't go into that here, but we can think together about what happens and then how to manage it. How do you know when you flip your lid? Can others notice? People always worry, everybody can see it. Some people, their face gets really red and people can notice. I sweat. Not everybody can notice that, especially on Zoom, but I start sweating. I'm sorry, then I have to go, what is happening? Why am I sweating so much? This is interesting. And thinking about what information is this reaction in me showing me and what can I learn from it? And you guys can you put your, oh, I think somebody did add something in the chat, Paula. How do you know, what, what is the self-talk when you're it's in trans, a- I translated family? flip your lid to Hebrew, just so everybody thank would make you. sure oh, they thank would. you, yeah. What, it, you know, what is the um, self-talk in the moment that you're flipping your lid? Oh my gosh, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to do this. I'm terrible at this job. Paula would do it better, right? There's usually a shame spiral, a freak out. In other words, you're here. Your prefrontal cortex is offline. How do we get back to here or somewhere there? We know we're not going to intervene in a flipped lid. How do you ground yourself in the moment in front of the family, in the session, in the classroom, right? What's, what's that like? And how do we help with that? Well, it does really require attunement to self that precedes that event. So it's a muscle that you have to work on developing. Again, here's Jerry Paul. It's not possible to work on behalf of human beings to try to help them without having powerful feelings aroused in you. We all have this. If we had a little more time, I would have you play with this idea a little bit. But Paul's gonna say, don't do it. The first person in the room <laughs> to regulate is you. Please think about how did you learn to do this in your professional role? And how might you think about supporting supervisees and their professional self? How do you understand your reactions and your responses to your work? What part is your own personal history? And how do you understand that? Who do you go to for help in thinking this through? And that venting is really not the same as reflecting. I would offer also, there's this real parallel to me that when difficult things happen, this was, this was you know, um, really trauma-informed care. Young children need parents and caregivers to help them make meaning of what they go through, to know that they, what they can expect next, and to learn to cope with challenging and overwhelming emotions in the context of a co-regulating other, right? This is the, the bedrock of what we all do. I think this applies for professionals. They need a relationship with someone who can help them make meaning of what the family went through and their own feeling responses to, who could know that th what they can expect, right? I've done this 5,000 times. I know you've done it once or never, right? I'm holding you until you have that experience of knowing and then learning to cope with challenging and overwhelming emotions through a co-regulating other. I would offer that um, you are part of the equation. It's important for us to think about what you do when you're dysregulated in a professional setting. And that MSR, mindful self-regulation, can help pull you back to the present. But in order to use that, you do have to practice it ahead of time. I was in a car accident a few years ago and my car had that button, you know, that, I don't know if you'll have that, um, the emergency, you can press it and it calls for help, but I had never practiced that. Why would you? And when you're in a car accident, and I actually had a head injury, I knew I had that feature, but I didn't know how to do it. So I couldn't use that feature because I hadn't practiced it and I hadn't formed that behavior chain or that neural synapse connection to implement that, right? So in order for this to be available to you at any time, 
you have to practice it. What would that look like? Well, there's lots of ways to think about implementing this and practicing this in supervision or on your own. Lots of things are regulating, but you have to have a practice outside of when you need it in order to be able to draw on it in the moment. Does that make sense? It can't, it doesn't just pop into being. It doesn't just pop into being. I had a few more slides, but I'm very aware of time, Paula. I would invite us to just at, wind up with thinking about that reflection means stepping back from the immediate intense experience of the hands-on work and taking the time to wonder what the experience means and recognizing our own thoughts and feelings and noticing when we feel critical or angry or judgmental of self or others, wondering about the thoughts and feelings of others and understanding the relationship between the two. So that, that um, Leering says that reflective practice can be understood as a critical self-reflection and self-awareness in relationship to one's professional practice that examines past actions, emotions, and experiences and responses and using that information to understand how and why we respond in a certain way. I really love to um, end my talks. Oh, someone asked about journaling. I'll have to answer that one. Um, with any aha moments or your takeaways or concepts that jumped out to you, I'm imagining that this is not um, really new territory for many of you. So I'd love to hear your responses or questions and invite them in the chat. And in, in Hebrew, Paula will translate for us. We have some excellent English speakers here as well. Great. Yes, we have an English person here who said, what is journaling? Is that a new American word? Keeping a journal, yes. Yeah, yeah. Writing your feelings out, yeah. That's right, on a journal. We have many excellent English speakers and whoever wants to ask a question in Hebrew and have it translated, you're also perfectly welcome to do so. I was just thinking personally about how I'm like going like this to myself and being so judgmental for myself about not doing all the things that you said, like you said, you said that um, reflective supervision is, you know, compassion. It's being able to understand, it's being able to be there and thinking, no, I don't do that well. That was kind of my reaction to the whole lecture. I don't have the time. Um, mm -hmm. Too many things come up. How do I we do that? Have, I often have a moment when I'm training, uh, when I was in the agency and, you know, hiring someone new and starting over, I feel like, ugh, feels so overwhelming. And I, how am I ever going to get them to where I need them to be. And I my internal pressure was to push for teaching and directing and telling versus right. creating space for their learning. Because we all know this as providers, it is so much more impactful for a caregiver when they come to it in their own aha moment than when you say, Hannah might say, mama, I'm gonna tell you this. And did you know that young children, da, 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 da. and we've all done that. Don't do it, it doesn't work. Nobody ever re retains that. I did it so much in my early profession because I was so excited about all the things I learned. Nobody listened to any of it. They're not there to listen to me. They're really there to be heard. As what everybody else's other people's experiences are. Um, can I say? Adina. Yeah. Hi. Adina I love cohort two. Yeah. Hi, Adina. <laughs> Hi. Trainer. Yeah, I, I Trainer and lecture. supervisor. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. So I loved your lecture. And I also I feel like I struggle when I'm working with new workers that I have the tendency that I really want to teach them like when I'm teaching CPP like to teach the ports of entry and like give them examples of what they should do and I was also connecting to what Paula was describing of kind of the sense the feeling of how much I have to give more space for just hearing them and what they're experiencing and how do you balance the two because you re I really want to teach them how to do it well are you coming on Wednesday Unfortunately, I'm teaching at that time. I want to do so much. <laughs> that, I think Paul is going to record it, but that whole workshop is about that subject, very specific to me, um, trainers and supervisors and CPP. Yeah, let me say a word about that. Um, uh, mm -hmm. On Wednesday, we have a lot of people already, but if anybody's interested in attending Lily's memorial workshop, 
It's going to be for both Israeli and American CPP supervisors, but not only, also people that work with families. And I'm a supervisor, people working with children and families. You're all invited to go onto our website, look it up, sign up. It's at Wednesday at 4 p.m. till 7.15. It's longer, it's a workshop. And I'm very excited about it because like last year, we're also going to be able to have the American, our American counterparts along with us, which is good. Yeah, there's a lot of American trainers coming and yeah. American providers coming. Um, and it's very experiential. So um, I'm just preparing you if you're We're not a big fan. We're going to have breakout rooms yeah, and exercises. It's really experiential. <laughs> <laughs> and so the topic there, not... yeah, I'm sorry, Paula. The topic there oh, is, do you teach or do you reflect? And how do you decide what you do and when? So that tension is alive, right? Because part of the, to me, in reflective supervision is being, um, um, transparent about, I hear that you, like pe my, my new to profession workers think that they know everything. I teach at Erickson Institute here. They think they know everything. They think that very expensive degree taught them how to be a therapist, right? And what it taught you is how to be an apprentice now, now but they don't know that yet. So I make that explicit. And there will be times that um, you and I will think about, well, gosh, I need some direction. I often ask, there's, we have a, we're at a, a crossroads for direction and reflection here. Which would you prefer? What would be helpful? Now, almost always they say direction because they're anxious. And I say, because you're gonna get both, <laughs> but you get to pick which one, right? Also trauma-informed, let them have some control there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Mishu, Mishi? Pikar Mishi? I just want to say thank you very much. Um, and also, um, most, a lot of the lecture I was actually sitting in the car and I was listening, listening to the last speaker, so it wasn't that easy. Um, but I want to say how important the, the supervision is because I know that I went through a phase, I, I, I've always been used supervision, also for myself and received supervision. But I went through a phase when I was working with um, some very traumatic um, families and I didn't have time for supervision because of my own life circumstances and it was very, very bad for me. So I'm just talking about, about the, the hugging and the holding and the community. So I just want to... Um, endorse that or strengthen it all Yeah, thank you, Sarah. It's so important because I, we, all, we all do that. I don't know if any of you have a meditation practice or a prayerful practice, and, and it's easy to lose that, you know, the, in the meditation community of which I'm a part, um, they often say you should meditate once a day, except when you're busy, and that's when you should meditate twice a day. But we take away the things that we need first. And I, I recently had some very experienced provider who comes to me for years said, I'm sorry, I have been missing um, consultation. I've been so busy. And of course, I'm thinking, oh, dear, we're at risk when you're so busy that you're forgetting to shore up the bottom of the pyramid. Then I start to worry about what's what's coming, you know, what's happening in the rest. Oh, thank you, Corey. Um, Paula, there's a couple of comments in the chat. I know, I, I, because they're in English, thank I you. figured you could read them, yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you <laughs> for English. Just wanted to say um, thank you for the opportunity to attend. And I love the precise use of terminology, direction or reflection. If we can label it, then we can be more aware of what we are doing and then we can do it better. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. Come Wednesday, more of that. Yeah, whoever can, we'll be happy to see you all. Yeah, I am. Okay, Marsha. Marsha Katz has a question, and that's going to be actually our last because I see right. Sigal Knepa's moving. Ready to go. <laughs> ready to, rearing, rearing to go. That's right. Great. So Marsha says, how do we take reflection and compassion and mindfulness out of the clinic and into the world? Oh, I love this question. So that we are better people, neighbors, citizens, and parents. Are the tenants the same? Wow, that sounds like a whole nother lecture. Um, and it's such a, a thoughtful question. I, and I think you're getting to it, which is intentionality. Being intentional and intentionally slowing ourselves down. When I think back to my youngest professional self and I cringe and my youngest personal self and I cringe more, right? And I try to then say, okay, let go of the shame. 
hold, take a breath and hold that in a place of compassion. What if we all did that around ourselves? And, you know, I think about our internet lifestyle now where it's so easy to respond and react to others, not realizing that's just revealing, in my opinion, unhealed parts of me when I have a strong reaction. It's not that Corey said anything wrong or triggering. It's that I, my triggers were activated. That has nothing to do with Corey. That has everything to do with my story and that there's more information for me to wonder about and learn about and look for ways to heal about that. But I love that. And there's lots of other smart people out there um, doing mindfulness training for providers out in the world um, that I think do. I think all mindfulness practice has impact and in our personal lives and in our social experience, our you know more macro experience. I love that we're thinking about that. And um, Paula, I'm gonna turn it over to you and Seagal. Okay, I'm actually gonna give you one more question that oh. Shimrit asked. And she asked okay. if you think that um, uh, there's a difference, well, you've been talking about, all about trauma, but she asked if there's a difference between cases where, um, uh, where there is a traumatic background to cases that there is not a traumatic background in terms of your reflective practice. Is the difference as a supervisor or supervisee? At the reflective practice, yeah, as a supervisor, I, I think. I mean, right, I, I, is that right? I think the answer is it depends, right? Because, because it's unique to the individuals participating in reflective supervision, it just depends. Now, what if there's some Venn diagram, right? An overlap between the story, the history of the provider and that traumatic story. Right, that we want, we would want to know about that, and I think providers and even supervisors in reflective practice get confused and worried about, well, when am I crossing over into something too personal that feels like therapy for my provider? And I do think that there is some crossover, and you need to relax about it. Everyone can just relax about it. I'm not going to tell you about my deep feelings about, you know, my earliest whatever. But if I know that because of some trauma story, so I have a, med a complex uh, medical trauma history in early childhood. That's my personal story. If Paul is supervising me, she needs to know that. She needs to know that if I have a traumatic, and I, and by the way, it will not surprise you that I specialize in medical trauma cases with young children, right? Huh, how did that happen? So, but, it, but if Paul is my new reflective supervisor, she needs to know that about me because I have feelings. <laughs> you know, I've had lots of therapy about it and I still, and I still, and I also have a perspective that I bring to the story that is unique as a young child who went through that, right? Now I hold that perspective much better than I hold the adult's perspective, you know, having lived it, but that can be, that can also be a blind spot. So I think it just depends, but I don't think reflective supervision is different. I think the thing to watch for is trauma avoidance, right? When we don't want to talk about trauma or new providers just kind of poo poo it like, oh, well, I'm supposed to be good at this. So I'm just going to say, oh yeah, I can handle it. And sometimes they, you know, how do you handle it? How do you handle You handle it through co-holding with someone else. That's how you learn to handle it. Like poor Paula, she, you know, she has handled the loss and being physically with Patricia in her loss by sharing it with all of us. And we hold it together and we hold her together. Yeah. A lot of us experienced it together too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much, Lily.